Hello and welcome to Cardio Life. I'm James Baggett, founder of Cardio Magazine, and today on the show I'm talking to Romans International's Tom Giaconelli. Good afternoon, Tom. Hi, James. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you for joining us, Tom. Um, Tom, a uh, quick introduction for yourself. Uh, Romans International uh, describes itself as the UK's leading independent supercar dealership. Uh, they sell everything from Porsche Macans to Bugatti Veyrons, um, and it specialises in some very prestigious metal. Uh, it's got a customer base around the world uh, and is based in Banstead in Surrey. The dealership was formed back in 1994 by Tom's dad, Paul, who continues to run the business today. Um, and Tom joined nearly nine years ago and has been a director of the company since 2016. This year, the same team have also launched Elevate Finance, a broker designed to help finance the kind of six-figure stock Romans specialises in, which we will chat about in a bit. But firstly, Tom, uh, perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about the history of Romans and, and how you got involved. Um, yeah, so it's, it's obviously been a family business. My dad set it up in, in 94. Um, he'd been in the, in the industry all his life. Um, but he set it up, basically he was running, he was a manager of a very successful Fiat dealership and he was seeing there was demand for sort of luxury cars back, back in those times. Um, and they were, they were very hard to get hold of. So he set up Romans as a sort of side, um, side business and he started sort of sourcing cars, a lot of them from actually abroad, um, and then selling them into the UK. Um, and he, he sort of helped create the whole notion of sort of beat the waiting list, pay, pay a premium. And that's sort of where, so it's, Romans has always been in sort of that high end market selling, selling luxury cars. And then it's just really evolved, um, you know, year on year since then. So I know the dealership quite well because I used to live in, in, in Redhill when I was working at Auto Express in London and on my commute every day I used to drive past your, your dealership and, and stare longingly at some of, the, some of the cars you had in stock. Tell the people who don't know your business uh, you know, what, what it looks like uh, and what sort of uh, number of stock you have and, uh, and where you're based. Yeah, so we're actually based on a on a main road. It's the A217, which is a road coming out of London. Uh, it goes all the way down to Brighton. So, and it's a dual, very, very busy dual carriageway. So you can't really miss it if you're driving past. You know, it's a big uh, showroom. We've got about 50 cars on site. Um, Forecourt holds, I think, more than half of them. And then you've got the showroom for the sort of super special stuff. Um, and yeah, so we've got everything from, as you said, Porsche McCann's and Range Rovers, which tend to be out in the forecourt. And then inside, you've got the likes of Bugatti Veyrons, Ferraris, uh, LaFerraris, um, you know, really special high-end stock. Um, so it's a nice variety. And we, you know, we deal with sort of all types of people and, and people all over the country and all over the, uh, all over the world. Um, I'd like to go into a little bit of detail about the cars in, in a moment. But before we get there, You've clearly been affected by this um, crisis just the same as many other dealers. Uh, how, how did it affect your, your, your business when you had to close? Yeah, I mean, we were, you know, worried like everyone else at the beginning. Um, you know, we, we, we didn't think we were going to do any business at all. Obviously, the showroom was closed. We, we sort of prepared the fact we weren't going to sell any cars at all during this time. Um, and yeah, obviously the overall market has been massively affected and that does filter through all the way to the top end. Um, you know, people are not being able to use their cars as they want to. Um, you know, we deal in mainly supercars and sort of performance cars. So, you know, we deal with petrol heads who, you know, they buy to enjoy their cars, most of them. Um, so yeah, less people are buying for sure. And there's less people out there. Um, but I think we've, we've been surprised by how much interest there has been, um, which I guess you, you, you take into consideration people are spending a lot more time at home, more time online. They've got the time to research, time to inquire. So we've seen like actually a really high um, inquiry level. Um, but I guess there's obviously been a lot of debate in the industry about what we can do, what we can't do. Um, you know, it's only really a week ago where we were specifically told by the government that we can definitely we're allowed to deliver cars. Um, so we've seen an even sort of higher inquiry level, especially in the last week or two. Um, and yeah, I think now it's becoming more acceptable that we can you know, deliver cars. Not not it's not just key workers. Um, 
we, we we're allowed to sell um you know online or remotely I, I know click and collect is sort of starting to be discussed more um whether that's actually sort of a lot of business during this time but we do feel once this lockdown is lifted um once the showrooms are allowed to be open again we do think that there's going to be a lot of pent up demand because we have seen such a high inquiry level um yeah especially especially in the last couple of weeks so have you actually managed to sell any cars during this time yeah so we, we sold a few cars um some of them we sold thinking we weren't allowed to deliver them till after lockdown um which the customers were fine with that they said yeah i want that car you know if it's in a month or two months don't worry i'll take it when it's when you can um so obviously now we are allowed to deliver cars some of those have been delivered um we've sold a few more since um so so yeah it's we, we definitely have been selling cars i mean a lot of there are a lot of people out there sort of thinking almost using the crisis as a reason to sort of lowball you um so we're getting a lot of this interest we're getting is people you know just testing the waters throwing out some some bids at you and and, and we're sort of you know we're holding firm to a certain level um you know we appreciate it's it's a buyer's market we have to be prepared to negotiate but at the same time i don't think there's a need to completely um you know do ridiculous deals and, and you know undersell cars because I, I i do believe there will be this pent-up demand and you know i think once dealers are back open fully i think you know you'll see sort of the prices firm up a bit so a couple of points on that what, what cars have you have you managed to sell um over the last last few weeks I and mean, what sort what sort of things are we talking um, we've sold a mixture. So we've sold a couple of 911s. We sold actually a, a Porsche 918 Spider just yesterday, um, which is, you know, closer, closer to a million pounds. Um, and there's, we sold the Lamborghini Aventador, a Ferrari 458 Speciale, there's sort of a quarter of a million pounds. So there's definitely people out there buying. There's definitely, and I guess it's a case of if someone really, really wants that car, they're still, you know, will be prepared to give you, give you the sort of asking money for it um but and and there has been actually it's probably more so in the classic car market um and left-hand drive car market because of the exchange rate i know there's a lot of dealers and classic car dealers who have been selling quite a few cars but a lot of them are going abroad um because the exchange rate is very attractive to overseas buyers um so there's definitely business being done um but yeah obviously most of the cars we sell right hand drive uk cars and we're selling to people in this country so there's there's definitely less less people buying than usual um and obviously more people sort of really looking for a bargain which you know we're, we're not really prepared to, prepared to do so so i mean when you're selling something like a 918 spider are, are those sorts of buyers chipping chipping you on the, trying to chip you on the price um to a certain point you know we're, we're open to negotiation obviously at those kind of levels we've got higher margins to play with um and especially if they're an existing customer we'll always you know look after them um but you know we're, we're realistic you know there's there's some cars you know we're, we're prepared to sit with and wait for the right person to come along you know there's other cars that are depreciating you know quicker so you know we're obviously minded to try and get rid of those a bit sooner um so yes yeah, it's, it's a mixed bag and, and i think you know it's quite a niche specialized market so we look at sort of each individual situation as, as they come along there'll be a lot of people out there being uh, quite staggered at the fact that someone spent a million pounds on, on a car during this time um, that must have come as a bit of a surprise to you as well i mean were, were you shocked that that suddenly came out of the woodwork um we weren't shocked we knew it was a very good car it was a, it was a lovely spec um you know there, there wasn't another one like it on the market so we knew it was priced right so we, we we thought someone would come along to be honest um and we're just we're glad it was someone we actually do quite a lot of business with and and he's someone that um i think has sold his business recently so he's he's you know looking to sort of build a collection and and, and get some get some special cars in so that was a, a good car for them for sure so tom last week uh, we reported on the mclaren 720s that sold on, on an auction website online for 100 it was a two-year-old car sold for 125,000 pounds which was effectively a 50 percent uh loss for that owner in two years i think you commented for us i mean 
when, when things like that happen, what does that do for confidence in the supercar market? Well, I mean, was that a one-off or, or is that a sign of things to come? Um, I mean, I, I personally don't think it's anything that unusual to see a car sell for that price, especially in this sort of lockdown where there are less buyers around. I, mean, I think when you put it into, when you see a headline figure like that, yes, it looks very low. And I know on social media, there was you know, people up in arms. There was a bit of a, a storm that the market had collapsed. Um, and you've got a very influential, respected figure in the, in the motor, in that, especially in, in that kind of market, who is sort of spreading out messaging that, you know, the market's sort of in, in huge downfall. But when you actually put the car into context, the fact that on that auction platform, you have to buy, uh, you have to pay a buyer's premium, which is, I think, six or seven thousand pounds, which takes the price up um, quite significantly. You also have to bear in mind that platform is private a private seller selling to another private seller um and 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 kind of we all know that people will generally pay tend to pay more to a dealer than they would for a private sale so and when you look at what other cars on the market we have a fairly similar car up for 139,000 pounds which we're actually pretty close to selling um that is actually not hugely wide of what it should have sold for um so so i you know i think in context it's it's kind of what's expected. McLarens are known for depreciating quite heavily anyway. Um, and yes, you know, it, it looks low when you see that initial 124,000 pounds, but I personally don't think it's a great indicator of sort of what people should be paying um, to, to a dealer like ourselves or, or a McLaren dealer. I find it um, quite hard to, to get my head around because the McLaren 720S is a brilliant car. Um, I mean, I drove the, the recent, uh, the Spider recently uh, for a road test in the magazine. Incredible thing. So good to drive. Really, really fast. Why on earth do they lose money so quickly? Yeah, um, they do. They're, they're actually amazing value for what they are. Um, but yeah, I think with McLaren, there's a few things. There's a few factors that come into it. They, they build a lot of models. Um, you know, and they're all sports cars. They don't make SUVs or saloons. So you've got all this model range and they keep making more and more new models before. As soon as you bought one of them, there's another one better that's out. And I think a lot of people, I know a lot of customers we speak to, that we speak to are, they've sort of lost a bit of faith in the brand. Um, because of that, you know, the depreciation gets heavy. They discount them very heavily from new um, after they've been out for a year or so. So the deals, you know, if you hear about you can get sixty thousand pounds off a brand new one, then automatically a used one is going to be even lower than that. So, I think I don't know why they set the prices so high to begin with. If I'm honest, I think if they made them less to begin with, you know, there would be a lot more people buying them. The depreciation wouldn't be as much, and they'd have a more of a positive spin on it. Whereas, you know, that combined with the fact they can tend to be unreliable. Um, you know, there are problems with sort of build quality and, and, and reliability. So that doesn't help. But, you know, they're still a fairly new brand. So I think, I think we've got to give them a bit more time to, to get that bit right. So you've mentioned a few cars that you've, you've managed to sell, sell during the lockdown. I mean, what's, your, what's your bread and butter? Um, and what would you buy tomorrow? Because you know you could sell the next day. Um, I mean, uh, bread and butter is things like G wagons, um, Range Rover, SVRs. So basically, like the high-end versions of like the SUVs, um, things like Audi R8s, Porsche 911s. That those are sort of our bread and butters. And we would, at the beginning, we were very much like, no, let's not buy any more stock. Um, you know, we 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 have the risk that we're not going to sell anything, so we don't want to tie up all our cash in more stock that's not going to sell. But we've we certainly noticed with the sort of inquiry level, we've we've made a decision to look. Let's let's actually look look at buying a few things. I mean, I bought a car this morning, a, a G wagon that I'll I'll go and um, we'll we'll get it picked up tomorrow. So there are cars that we are we are looking at, um, looking at buying, and there are buyers out there. So um, and hopefully, you know, once this lockdown's lifted, whether it's another week, two weeks, you know, we want to be prepared with with some nice fresh stock uh, going into that period. What about supercars? I mean, what, what's your favourite supercar to sell? Uh, my favourite supercar to sell would be 
probably one of the German cars because uh, they tend to be more reliable so you don't get any issues. But I guess, I mean, I don't get too involved in sales, but I know it's always great selling someone a Ferrari, um, especially if it's their first Ferrari. That's like, you know, kids' dreams. And, you know, when you're the person handing it over a car of their dreams, it's, it's always a special occasion uh, for the salespeople. Um, but yeah, obviously the best ones for us to sell, the ones that are, tend to be covered under manufacturer's warranty. Um, and, you know, the, la the latest cars is always, always nice to, to, to get out there. How about these, these hyper cars that, that, that you guys specialize in? I mean, how do you go about deciding to buy a Bugatti Veyron and, and tying up that amount of money in, in, in one model? Yeah, it's, um, it's always a, a brave move when, when we buy a car like that, especially if we haven't got anyone lined up for it. But, you know, we, we track the market very well, so we know you know most of the time we know what a car should be worth and what it should sell for because the market's been very sort of fluctuates fluctuates a lot over the last few years i mean three or four years ago it was at a real peak and every, everything was going up in value so it was actually a lot easier because you you know you're sort of safe buying something it was going up in value um and i think a lot of the clients had that same mindset um whereas now over the last sort of 18 months it's going it's been going back the other way so you can get caught out a lot easier um so but then but that does bring because there's sort of more negativity around that does bring opportunities uh as well because not meant there's very few dealers in this country there's probably a very small handful that will lay out that kind of money you know, a million two million pounds for a, for a car just to take into stock there's so you're really you know and, and a lot of these people are existing customers who you know don't begrudge you a profit a lot of time they're making a profit as well when they sell it to you especially if they bought it brand new um but yeah look there's there's definitely they've become harder to sell because they've stopped going up in value so people are really now buying them for, for the right reasons because they really want that car they want to drive it um and there's less of people sort of buying just to sort of stick it away and and, and hope that it goes up in value there's, there's a lot less of that going on at the moment so what are the most expensive models you've got in, in stock at the moment? Um, we have got, at the moment, we've got, we've got a LaFerrari in stock, which is 2.295 million. Um, we've got a Bugatti Grand Sport Vitesse, which is a convertible Veyron, very special car, which is just under 2 million. Um, so we've got, we've got a few cars in that sort of price range between sort of one and one and two million um but yeah there's and, and as i said there's there is a lot of interest in them because of especially from abroad because of the exchange rate um so we're hopeful um hopeful it won't be too long before a couple of those you know find find new owners so what sort of savings are those people who are who are buying from abroad making at the moment because of the exchange rate um i don't know the exact percentage but um they're definitely a lot less than they were you know, three or four months ago. So they're, they're looking very attractive, especially for cars that are already sort of taxes paid that they don't have to pay VAT to get it registered in their country. So um, yeah, they're, they're definitely a, a good saving. I'm not sure on the, the exact percentage though. Well, uh, and when it comes to, to values of, of, of supercars, and I, we'll, we'll sort of move on to classic cars in a moment, because I know you've got some, some, some interest in those too. But in, in the values of supercars at the moment, sort of discounting the McLaren issue, how are they performing during, during this crisis? Uh, and what are your thoughts for how they're going to perform in the, in the coming months? Yeah, I think um, the, the fact is that over the last 18 months, the market has been going down anyway so this you know people are seeing prices now thinking oh sudden, this is a sudden collapse of the market but, it, but it's not it's, it's been going that way anyway um so i think it will continue going that way um for you know the near future um there are there are still lots of people with money you know these 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 people haven't lost their passion for cars they haven't um you know haven't become poor overnight so there's still plenty of people out there but they are just more you know more conscious of you know getting the right spec getting the right car getting the right condition 
Um, so it's like you just have to be more particular. You've got to be much more careful. Um, and that that would be, you know, advice to give to all our clients is, you know, really check out the history of the car and make sure that it is the exact right article before you buy. Um, and I think long term it will come back. You know, I think we're, you know, we've had Brexit, we've had the whole global economy has been in a sort of bad state the last, you know, year or two. And it's been, you know, like property, you know, London property has been going down for a while. It will bounce back eventually and those and these special cars will bounce back. So, you know, you could take a long term view and I'm sure some people would um, that, you know, hang on, ride the waves and, and eventually we'll, we'll come out of this just, just fine. Sorry, we, we, we lost you ever so slightly towards the end of that one, um, Tom. Um, when it comes to dealing with with buyers who are who are spending this sort of money, I mean, is it is it a long sales process, or are they just too busy to spend any time of it, and they send you a send you the money uh, via bank transfer and pick it up the next day? It's a real mixed bag, to be honest. You get both ends of the spectrum. You get some people who literally arrive at the showroom very impulsively buy a car and then we'll sometimes take it there and then um but you get other people who it's like a year-long process sometimes longer where they've been carefully watching the market they've been waiting around for the right car they know what they want and they're in no rush and they'll take their time so you you just have to be prepared to to always be ready for you know whichever and and sometimes you've got to play the long term that goes for for buying them as well when you know someone's got a very special car they've thought about selling it, but they're not quite ready. And you kind of just keep in contact with them, maintain your relationship and, and, and you know, always give them good advice. And eventually when the time comes to sell it, hopefully you'll be the, the first people they'll come to. Um, but yeah, this is, it, can, it can happen just like that out of the blue. When it came to shutting down your, your, your showroom, during the, when this crisis kicked off. And what did you have to do with all that stock? I mean, there must be, it must be quite worrying leaving cars worth two million pound plus in a, in a showroom by a busy dual carriageway. Yeah, so we, we actually moved all the stock from outside other than the SUVs and secured them and locked them away. Um, obviously the showroom is fully secure. It's got CCTV all over the place. Um, so we weren't too worried about that, but yeah, we, we didn't want to have loads of you know sports cars and supercars just sat out there um so so we locked we, we got them all stored and locked away um so yeah lots of people have been driving past and being like oh my god it's it's empty um we're getting lots of messages like what's happened to all the cars um but they're all safe and sound um and we started we started to put some of them some of them back now we've, we've um we originally actually furloughed uh most of our staff we kept um, about a five-man team just to keep operations going. Um, we've topped up all our staff to 100%, so none of them are losing out. No one's been laid off, um, and hopefully they'll, you know, all be back at back at work soon. Um, but yeah, the cars uh, are all are all in in, in a good state. There's a, there's a different picture from different, depending on where you look at when we're going to get back to business as usual. Some say next Monday, some say May the 18th in line with, with, with Ireland uh, and the dealers there have been told they can go back. Well, when, are you, when do you think we will be back in business and, and what steps are you having to put in place for your business to allow that to happen? Um, well, I mean, the rumours are they're going to announce something very, very soon. Um, and because car showrooms are generally, you know, quite spacious places, you know, we don't get a lot of footfall um, in terms of customers. You know, it's, our sales are pretty sporadic. So you never get, you know, lots of people turning up, waiting around, queuing or whatever. So so we're, we're quite comfortable that when the time comes um, that showrooms are allowed to be back open, if customers want to come in to view a car, um, that we'll be able to facilitate that. Um, you know, we, we, there's talk that we might become a by appointment only because before we were, had an open door policy, people could turn up. Um, so we'll probably look to implement that as a by appointment so we don't get just, you know, people, people turning up. Um, and then we might run a sort of week on, week off with staff. We're not, we're not sure. We're, gonna, we're just going to keep a close eye on what the government advise and, and just follow that pretty closely. I mean, whether we have to put up 
protective screens or wear face masks. You know, we'll we'll do whatever the government advises. Yeah, it's certainly going to be a, a different world when, when we do get back to work. Um, let's touch on on Elevate Finance and the, and the brokerage that you've that you've just set up. Um, how how does that work? Um, and is it an advantage to the business? Um, yeah, so it was set up um, with a view that we had quite a lot of customers um, who have dealt with over the years. You know, some of them obviously they they follow the car they want, and if we don't have it in stock. You know, it will be at another dealer. So, they, but they, because of the relationships we had with them and the relationships we have with the finance companies, they still did the finance through us. Um, and, and we just felt that was actually a really growing market. And, you know, a lot of people don't know who to go for, who to trust. You regularly hear of stories uh, from customers who have been, you know, found themselves in really bad positions uh, with, with finance agreements. So we felt we could, you know, we could give our customers originally um, that kind of good advice and, 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 and construct the deals for them. And then we just felt we were getting, especially during this time, we were getting more and more people inquiring about finance, about equity release, um, about payment holidays. And we just felt we already had this sort of mini business in the background, um, but we never really pushed it. We never really publicized it. Um, and we just felt that let's let's make a, a bigger thing of it. Let's put it out there to the public. Um, we already deal with a few other prestige car dealerships um, who don't have an in-house business manager, so we act like a broker um, for them as well. Um, and and you know we use our relationships we have with with the likes of Santander, Aldermore, because we do a lot of business with them. You know, big lumps of money, big um, you know big values. So, so we do get preferential terms and, and we can actually give those terms to other dealers and obviously other clients, uh, private clients. So yeah, that's, that's something we've, we've looked to push during this time. And, and there has been um, you know, quite, a few, quite a lot of business being done. It has become actually harder and harder because the finance companies have become a lot more stringent on who they're lending money to during this time. Um, you know, some, some finance companies have flat out refused to finance or to pay out um, for, for cars unless it's a key worker. So it's been quite challenging um, to actually get, get sort of things over the line. Um, but hopefully, hopefully that will sort of, hopefully it will become a little bit easier. And what sort of money are we talking about on a, on a monthly payment for something like a LaFerrari? I mean, what, what, what are people expecting to, to pay out? Um, well, it depends how much you borrow, but I know some of the, I mean, we've, we've funded a few LaFerraris and if you take into consideration, they're going to, people are actually paying upwards of like £30,000 a month. Um, but a lot of these people are investors, they've obviously got their finger in a lot of pies and, and finance is actually pretty cheap car finance. You know, if you think of 3%, um as the actual interest rate you know, a lot of these people can make more than three percent on their money by investing and things so they actually see fine they've all got the money to pay for that LaFerrari they've all got more than enough money to pay for it but they actually think you know what I would rather put my money into something else than something that could depreciate um and they use the finance finance for that so yeah, it sounds a lot, 30 grand a month, especially when they've got multiple cars that can be, you know, hundreds of thousand pounds coming out a month, which is which is quite crazy, really. But yeah, that's that's the sort of very top end of the world, I guess. I think it's a, an incredible amount. Um, what would you what would you say is the most resilient car during this time? I mean, if somebody was going to put their money in, in, in a model, what, what would you be recommended? Yeah, it's a difficult one. Um, I, I've certainly noticed the stuff that's like they don't make any more of uh like more analog based cars you know the likes of the ferrari f40 the likes of the porsche carrera gt which are manuals very very special cars but they'll they'll never make another car like that again i think they're the safest ones if you're thinking right what's not going to lose any money what's going to might go up in value they're the ones that have probably got the best chance um or so, something very very rare but because modern technology is moving all the time, you know, the, the latest cars quite quickly are not the latest cars. Um, so you have to be 
I, I would always advise to drive, buy something you really, really want. If it goes up in value, happy days. If it goes down in value, you know, you bought a car you absolutely loved, so this shouldn't be the end of the world. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think the notion of just buying a car, hoping it goes up in value, you know, and not even driving it, I, I think, you know, it, it's not something we, we actively advise at all. What about um, the people you actually sell to? I mean, I take you, you you've sold some cars to some famous people. Uh, yeah, yeah, we do deal with uh, plenty of famous people. Um, I'm, I'm not going to name names, unfortunately, but you can you can imagine uh, the likes of the music stars, footballers, um, you know, various various types of of celebrities. But but not they're not by any means our sort of you know focal point. Um, you know, the, the the people we tend to deal with more are more like CEOs and directors of businesses, um, all types of businesses, you know, of every industry. Um, so yeah, they tend to be, you know, the, the people we deal with on a day to day basis. And then you will get um, celebrities or celebrities agents often uh, negotiate on their on their behalf. Um, but yeah, we we meet some interesting characters. Is, that's for sure. And um, Tom, I know you said earlier that you didn't don't get too involved in the sales, but you've you've clearly done some over, over your time. Um, what would be your most memorable one? Is there is there a sale that really stands out as uh, in your mind? Um, one that stands out. I mean, <laughs> there's one that stands out that. I won't name what car it was, but there was, um, we actually bought the car off them and it was a very expensive car. And about after two months, we hadn't actually sold it. Um, he missed it so much. He wanted it back so much that, and, you know, we sat with it a little while and, and it's, and it actually happens quite often this where someone sort of regrets selling it and, and, Normally, it's like three or four years later, like, oh, if you ever get that car in again, oh, I'd love to buy it back. But this was like two months later, and he ended up buying it back for quite a bit more than what we paid him for it. <laughs> so he just lost himself, I mean, a, a great amount of money. But, you know, that's what happens. It's, it's an emotional, you know, tug. Um, and, and, you know, it, it happens that we, we have seller's remorse as well as buyer's remorse, I guess. Do you, um, do you enjoy your job? Do you enjoy your job at all? I do. I, I mean, it's it's stressful and sp like working with my dad in, in the family businesses. It has its uh, ups and downs, but I mean, I love it. I mean, it's it gives me so much drive and energy. Um, there's so much more I want to do with the business, and you know, it's it's always you know it's very fulfilling, and I, I really enjoy day to day. Um, but you know, like any job, I'm sure you have your your bad days, your stressful days, and and, and your great days. I uh, I don't think I'll be able to work with my dad. He struggles to um, get on a Zoom call every every, every week. <laughs> it would be incredibly frustrating. So so all power to you for doing that. Um, what about when it comes to your business in, in, in the future? Is it going to be radically different, or do you think you're just going to go back to business as normal? Um, I mean, in the short term, obviously, it's, it's not going to. It's definitely not going to go back to complete normal. Um, but we're never going to veer too far away from what, what we're good at, what we've always done. Um, you know, we're never going to look into getting into servicing or anything like that. We are a sales business. Um, you know, we deal in the very best cars in the world. So we always want to be that to be our, our core. Um, but there are little things, um, you know, we want to get involved in. We, so I think there's, there's definitely a transition um, happening, becoming more online based. So we want to, we want to look at that um, and you know look look at little things of how we can we can do things more things online um, and there's other areas as well we, we we're looking at but um, but yeah we'll we'll never veer too far away from what what we're known for. It's clearly been a very difficult time time for the industry and um, and, and very difficult for many dealers. But what positives have you got to look forward to, and you think the rest of the industry has too? Um, the positives, I guess, I don't know. Um, I think in the short term, I'm sure there's a lot of frustration around. I know some of our staff 
um, itching to, to get back to work, you know, they're, they're, they're bored at home. Um, so I think it's, it would be great to get everyone back together. You know, we all miss our friends and our family, especially if, if we haven't seen them at all. Um, and I think, you know, the positives of, of building that community around yourself again, you know, in your day-to-day -day, um, activity, I think that's something that I know a lot of people are looking forward to. Um, and then, yeah, we, we're just looking forward to getting back to, to doing what we do. Um, we, we believe, you know, the market will, will recover. Um, you know, it's going to be a difficult time, which we're going to just have to, you know, grit our teeth and, you know, go into this sort of recession that I guess we're going into and just, you know, trade as, as best we can. And hopefully, um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll come out of it um, in better shape than we are now. And what's the most important thing this crisis has taught you, Tom? Um, the most important thing that this has taught me, um, I'm, it's a difficult one. I mean, I think having, having time, me personally, having time on my hands uh, to work on things and, 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 and structure things in a much more organised manner, whereas we tend to be pretty manic day to day normally, and as you know, I've got 10 different people asking me questions every, every other minute. Um, so it's, it's definitely sort of being in isolation has, has, has been a bit of a blessing, I think. Um, but, you know, I think community has become a bigger thing. Uh, and, you know, seeing, you know, chatting to people and, and being, you feel, especially in London where I live, where not many people normally speak to each other. Um, and that, that has changed quite a lot. I find you know, there's much more of a, a, a sense of community where, around where I live as well. Um, so that's been a real positive, I think. Yeah, I'd 100% um, agree with you there, Tom. Tom, thank you very much for giving up your time today to chat to us. I, I wish, you the, wish you the best of luck with the business going forward and hopefully you find a buyer for that LaFerrari soon. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully. Thanks ever so much. Um, so cool. this the thanks, show. James. Thank you, Todd. This week on the show, I've got a whole host of guests lined up, um, including tomorrow, it's uh, Wheeler Dealers' Mike Brewer, and on Thursday, it's Langley Prestige's Simon Webb. Uh, Friday, of course, we haven't got a show, it's a bank holiday, um, but nobody really knows what they look like anymore because we're always inside. But anyway, if you uh, want to get involved in car dealer lives like this one, you can email me, james at blackboardmedia.co.uk. You can find me on Twitter at car dealer ed or LinkedIn, send me a message there. If you want breaking news from car dealer magazine, send direct to your phone. I've set up another car dealer magazine WhatsApp group, the last one filled up in a week. Um, so if you want to be added to that, send me a message of those uh, methods I just mentioned and i'll get you included uh, there's a full schedule for cardio live on our website uh, scroll down on the home page cardiomagazine.co.uk and you'll find out who's coming up over the next few weeks uh, thanks once again to tom for joining me today and i'll see you all tomorrow goodbye